Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second uh, episode of uh, the Leeches 45 45 League game analysis. Today, we are going to look at uh, the game that got picked from board two. Uh, the two players are in the white trunks AXP156, uh, sporting rating of 2042, versus his opponent, uh, the one and only Buffer and Deran, uh, sporting the black trunks and uh, rating of 1988. Um, and uh, in introduction, or as an introduction, brother. Uh, I would like just to mention that last time I used the word uh, irrational for our first game to describe some of the components that uh, sort of built a very, very crazy and wild game. And I have to say that even this game is a little bit uh, verging on the irrational at some points and uh, lots of back and forth struggles will be seen. So um, I think that uh, you are in for another treat. So buckle up and uh, enjoy the ride. Let's see how this uh, awesome game went. E4, C6, Knight C3, D5, Knight F3. So we have got the two knights variation against the Karo Khan and as a true Karo Khan aficionado, uh, our buffer and their run friend plays Bishop G4. Um, H3. Just for the record, a lot of club players here, here fall for this trick when they think that they can transpose into the Bishop f5 main line that was uh, popularized by Capablanca and they very often go down the gurgle with this knight e5, bishop h7, queen h5, g6 and then bishop c4 victory and white is already coming out almost winning from the opening after e6, queen e2 threatening with knight f7. It is just a side note uh, for those who are uh, interested in uh, the ins and outs of the Karakhan but uh, he bishop g4 was played, h3 did take of six or theory the i thought that the three d4 were theoretical moves here tal used to play d4 here very often ending up sucking the pawn on d4 and having the two bishops and his wild attacking style together quite often headed up to something spectacular and d3 is also a line not sure about the ship b2 but perhaps it just transposes after something like d4 knight b1 and then d3, knight, d2. So I'm guessing this is fine too. I'm not quite familiar and I didn't look up the theory of this variation, but to me it seems definitely now like a transposition. Right, knight, d7, d3. And the first odd move was played here by black, which was uh, knight, e5. Bishop somewhere is like a logical move. Whether it, be, whether it be e7 or d6, I can't really tell. But uh, definitely completing development and casting is a uh, correct concept here. 95 seems to be triggering two things. One, forcing the queen off at the f3 square, quite wanted to do anyway. And the other one is to play f4, which is going to come now with a tempo, quite wanted to do that too. So this was a very unfortunate regrouping, especially because if we look at the pawn structure, we are very likely going to end up in a pawn structure like this. And here we are talking about pawn chains. And the pawn chains are basically your number one clues as to which part of the board you are supposed to play. And if we complete this pawn chain, it's pointing this way. Now black's pawn chain is somewhat incomplete, but more often than not you find that this pawn comes up here and that one comes here. So his is pointing this way. And the d4 pawn already indicates that he has got the space advantage on the queen side. So black is meant to be playing on the queen side. White is meant to be playing on the king side. So then what on earth is this knight doing here instead of keeping it somewhere here? So this was uh, basically a false concept for many reasons. Um, f4, queen c7. Quite sure again. Uh, developing moves like bishop to either of these two have looked uh, quite decent to me and here although black uh, sorry uh, the computer does agree with the choice that white uh, has played here I think that uh, the very logical knight e2 followed by chucking the knight onto c4 or f3 and just continuing development calmly would have resulted in a far more manageable position without any of the dramas that occurred after c3 C3 is a very, very double-edged weapon here because 
what it does do is that it opens up lots of files and diagonals, which the diagonals is technically favoring the side that has the two bishops, in this case white. But at the same time, it cracks open a diagonal that definitely favors black, and also it opens up the position when everybody is still at home. Which is very much against the important chess principles, which is why the diehard classic at heart in me wants to first develop and only then challenge the center and not the other way around. This being said, the move is correct, but once again, it brings about changes in the position that will make again the game uh, somewhat irrational. See introduction earlier. Bishop c5, very logical. Black is trying to now bruise the king on this diagonal as best as he can. And white continues with uh, the craziness and plays b4. Um, which is actually turning out to be not a great move at all. And in fact, instead, King H1 was to be preferred. Um, but again, if that's the best, followed by knight e2, knight f3, then I have to even question Stockfish in recommending this line over the far more logical knight in first, perhaps even bishop out, tuck the king away, and when we are ready, that's when we launch with c3, if we even want to or need to, because of course, once the knight appears here, we have got lots of other options in the center, or even just here, that allow us to play for e5, knight, e4. Anyway, c3, bishop b4, uh, bishop c5, b4, bishop back in c4. So with this, now white is gaining even more space, so now we are dominating the king side and the queen side. But the tension has been removed, the position remained totally closed, which technically favors the knights versus the bishop. But what my biggest worry is that we are on move 14 and we still haven't moved a single piece on the queen side, whereas black can talk about a complete pivot. Not a very harmonious or threatening one, but nonetheless, he is fully developed. Okay, now the bishop is under some heavy firepower due to the c5 threat, so a5 was a must. Um, and e5 played, which was quite a cheeky move, uh, because now it's perfect that it kind of, the knight can't jump in here, looks like it has nowhere to go really, but as tactics and luck would have it, of course the beautiful knight e4 was on the ready for black, and now I can still utilize this awesome bishop here, so if I were to take the d3 check, uh, could hurt a little bit, even if c5 comes I take here with a tempo, so um, yeah. This uh, could get quite juicy. In fact, the tactics don't stop here because after rook e1 I can play something like queen d8 or queen d7 with this check, picking up the other rook. And this way I may utilize the squares that I've opened up uh, by this queen move. So this little tactic was missed. Black dropped back to g8, which is always a no-go as far as I'm concerned. So Whenever you are going backwards, you should literally look at every single legal move before you do that. And this will actually be a little bit of a theme for both sides in this game. You will find that both sides will completely undevelop their pieces and consequently end up in an absolutely rubbish position. Um, now g8, c5, back and a3. So now keeping the pawn chain in intact, very logical. And again, white's position is looking very menacing. All he needs to do is to complete development and uh, the win is in the pocket because our space advantage now is so depressing that uh, black can't really do much about it. He's trying to blow up the position and sadly white here um, has to respond to it. Um, the tactician and the attacking player in my mind wants to play in ID to ignore, just go in. This is how I like to play chess, and I think this is how good chess is played. And actually, now that I'm looking at the assessment of the computer, even the mighty Stockfish agrees with me, because now we are exploiting the most important factor position, which I haven't spoken about yet, the king stuck in the middle, which it is going to be left there forever now, because knight d6 check is inevitable, and the subsequent f5 with opening the f-file is going to finish the business off rather soon. So that was the moment when White should have focused his uh, energy on, okay, I need to attack now, instead of worrying about this pawn chain, which is really neither here nor there. So take, take, 92 was played now, far, far worse compared to the previous one, because now if I take here with the bishop, 
and I'm covering the important piece in square. In contrast to knight d2 here, pawn takes, and the knight e4, the bishop is still uh, five chessboards away from the main arena where the main fight is being fought. Okay, so take, take, knight d2, bishop c5, knight e4, beautiful. Still on the right track, and we're doing all what we need to do. Now the bishop went back e7. And this was one of the most important uh, points of the game. And um, White he started to pursue a very, very sad and very commonly seen strategy on the amateur scene. And that is that instead of trying to exploit one type of an advantage, and I will reveal to you in a second which one that is, he is going to pursue a different one that most amateur players are addicted to, to say the absolute least, and that is material. So here he chose to play king uh, queen f2, trying to attack these two pawns, these two pawns, utilizing the better development instead of focusing on what every chess player at all times should be focusing, which is to destroy the king. Because guess what? That's the aim of the game. You are supposed to attack the king, not a pawn. And of course, we do attack pawns a lot in this beautiful game of chess when we can't do anything better. However, here after f5. Black's position would have collapsed so, so rapidly. It's quite amazing. EF, Rook F. Not how the knight can't develop at all. So I have all the time in the world to just play Bishop D2, bring the Rook, and happy days. Complete development, destroying the opponent, who is struggling to dodge the punches coming from left and right and center. Everything is said about this position by the best move. If that's the best move in this position for black, sorry, here, then we know everything we need to know about this position because after takes, takes, check, takes, takes, this is a pathetic picture from black's point of view about what has happened to his position. Being stuck in the middle, after something like queen d7, I can get queued with a check like this. Definitely denying castle for good and uh, mopping this one up should be child's play, literally. I think it's gonna be happening pretty slow because check and I pick up the rock. So here it is just a one simple move going forward, attacking, opening fast diagonals, diagonals for the bishops, and that's it. King caught in the middle is the biggest disaster that can happen to you in an opening like this. And instead, white goes for this. Now if you compare that, imagine you are black, you go like even if, even if I lose d4, that's 10 million times more tenable than anything that would have come at me after this. So when you see a move like this landing on your board as black, you go like, oh, thank God. I have been given some time to finish development, to tuck my king away and survive the worst. Thank you very much. I mean, imagine you get this as black, f5 takes, rook takes, and then you go like, hmm. Right, I can't move this, I can't move this, I can't castle either way even though I desperately need to, and this guy is about to murder me in two more moves. Right, let's resign, hit the canteen, and uh, have a drink and bounce back for round two. Whereas after queen f2, like, okay, I'm gonna fight it. That's exactly what black did here. Played rook d8 defending the pawn, and white continues the completely wrong and false strategy by attacking this pawn. Here f5, if possible, would have been maybe even more powerful because after ef, queen f, now we actually have a mate threat. And I can already see and hear everybody going like, yeah, but e5 is hanging. Hallelujah that it's hanging. So that now not only do I have an open f file, but I have an open e file and an open diagonal. When you are not playing chess like this, you are not playing chess. That's my view on this business. If you don't play f5 here, everything else is just nonsense. Because that is how you achieve your objective. What is your objective? Mate the king. Right, bishop b2? Don't think so. f5? Absolutely. Takes, takes, and I'm right onto him. I'm not taking any prisoners. Now I take bishop f4. And it's struggle town. Black is falling apart here in spectacular pace. 
If you go here, I go check. You go G6, I go, hmm, maybe I will take you. Tactics always work in the favor of the attacker. And it's beautiful too, like bishop takes, bishop takes here. And um, we are going to, yeah, win everything. Like this pin is so awesome. Look at it, queen takes and rook e1. That is the testament to a better developed army, well utilized. That's it. Bishop takes. We are going to come in from here. And this is not something to sneeze at either. It's quite amazing. A lot of people tell me when they see good players stream or play chess that how awesome lines they manage to conjure and how awesome checkmate motifs they can see in their games and so on. They don't happen by chance. They happen as a direct result of utilizing the possibilities and opportunities that are there. And the club player can execute these attacks just as finely as long as they stick to these concepts. Now moving on. White is still way ahead in the game. Um, and consistently continuing this consistently wrong concept and now even removing pieces from the queen king side where he should have finished off this business uh, just for as a side note bishop d1 it was a very cheeky and clever move uh, reintroducing the bishop into the game from this angle once again with the intent of hassling the king he black should have played knight h6 Finally celebrating the fact that the knight can re-enter the fray. Should have never ever happened in this game by the way. And he's quite fine. Instead he stepped out of this spin on the c file, which is quite logical. And white again consistently is building up on this weak c5 pawn, completely missing the point, but still maintaining the upper hand. Knight h6, good move. G4. I quite like it, the computer hates it, but I like the concept behind it. For the first time, white is thinking correctly, I need to restrict the black pieces before they penetrate my position. The problem is that we are running too late to this party, and f6 is already quite painful, but I will show you this motif one more later. Castles, rook c1, and this is where white would have paid a very, very harsh price for um, removing all these pieces from the king side to the queen side, and abandoning this attack. And leaving the structure somewhat loose. Here, queen b8, very cheeky move to attack the bishop. Rook up, and f6 would have turned this game totally 100% on its head. All of a sudden, if you remember when I compared the two armies, pointing out the useless black pieces, knight here, knight here, and the bishop, wherever it was, look at it now. Useless, useless, useless. e5 is hanging. And I can't even take on f6 because of knight f4, or I can even afford taking this. And now it's incredibly difficult, in fact impossible, to sufficiently defend the pawn on f4. Please note that g5 loses to knight takes f4 followed by the knight fork there. And lo and behold, we are getting absolutely murdered on the very side of the board where literally 5 minutes ago we should have won the game. This is how chess punishes you for playing inconsistently and letting the chances slip away from you. Um, instead, however, rook d5 was played. Sadly, black is also focused on defending this pawn instead of trying to counter punch. a4. As far as these moves are concerned, everything for both players, and they both have quite a big tunnel vision here, revolves around the c5 pawn. White is trying to win it like hell. And black is trying to defend it like there was no tomorrow. King h8, no idea why that move was played. Once again, a counter strike on the king side would have been really, really unpleasant white to deal with. Excuse me. Once again, note how tricks like this don't work. I can just simply take it, and there is a pin here. I takes, so I'll take it again. Although actually, knight f4 looks very menacing too because knight h3 is threatened g5 is hanging too. So this is actually a knockout game over. So after f5 I can't even take, or if I take, sorry I can't play g5, I have to say do something different, but once again these minor pieces are now building up a lot of pressure onto the king. 
Okay, King H8 was played, Bishop A3, Rook C8, very logical, very consistent stuff. Bishop F1, Bishop H4, and that actually this was the point of the game where I received the biggest shock in terms of expected versus unexpected moves. Because here White played a move that would have never ever occurred to me. Um, he played here Queen H2. Which is just... Yeah, I can't really find words to describe it because I so don't understand it. Queen is under attack and it has to guard the pawn on F4. So any move that looks semi-decent that keeps the Queen in the, boy in the game looks just totally sufficient for White to maintain a large advantage. Instead, he buried his queen away on h2. I really don't know why. Like, I tried as best as I could to explain this to myself. I couldn't. But worse, after bishop e7, he then completed the burial service with bishop g2. Look at that. Like, we are playing with a queen down now. Who would do that and why? I, I'm, I really got puzzled by this. So, yeah, I was thinking that maybe White was just so focused on the fact that he was going to win c5 and that will decide the game. That he didn't care about the rest of his army. But this is a shocking placement of pieces considering that I could have the queen now here instead. Attacking a5, defending the rooks, being able to triple up if need be. And just in general be on a square that strike as, strikes as, as an apparently obvious one. Knight h4, bishop h1, hallelujah, the queen is finally ready to come back, so it's all fine and dandy. Knight g8, mm, not a big fan of that one as you would imagine, I never really like going backwards. But it's difficult to offer anything for black because whilst he built up a, for the time being, sufficient static defense of the c5 pawn, he lost all flexibility and he can't do a thing. So he dropped back the knight. F2, finally the queen is returning to the fray and the rook went back to c8. Yet another backward motion, so now we are up to two. And here white could have uh, actually traded off this bishop, which is the defender of everything. And again, this is so typical that he greed kicked in for white and finally harvested the pawn. Instead, he could have played in knight d6, hitting rook, hitting mate in one. But the most important point of this move is that after take stakes, I have the two bishops versus the two knights in a very open position. <clears throat> c5 and d4 are falling, inevitably. And on top of all this, the h4 knight is hanging. So essentially, this is done, dusted, game over. Once again, we are en route to the canteen because the game is over. And all it took was just not to get too greedy and cash in right away, but to try to exploit the fact black is stretched way too thin, way too thin, <clears throat> with his bishop being the only defender. After the trades, and again, <clears throat> that hurt me a lot. We have a choice of taking the bishop or the knight. Which one is a better place piece for the time being, and which one is going to be in more trouble after the capture? If we take here, the bishop drops back to e7, the game continues. If you take on c5, after takes, takes, now this knight is a disaster, and when it goes back, we go back to our favorite theme, f5, now knight e7 is not playable due to uh, take, take, knight g5, mate, and e6 is on. Note how knight e6 not only attacks, but defends the rook, and so knight has to go back to f8, again, look at this. Two moves ago, five, we had knights here, here, or even knights here. All black pieces back on the back rank. White kept on going forward, black kept on going backwards. As a direct result, the game is essentially over again. Uh, White is a pawn up and has got an absolutely terrifying attack. And is still attacking weak pawns left and right and center. Black can't do literally anything. Instead, we opted for Queen H4, which I think was made in the belief that Black was losing this piece on the pin, and I think that Bishop E7 must have been over. Whoopsies, sorry. Uh, Bishop E7 must have been overlooked. Well, why? That's the only explanation why I think he took on H4 instead of uh, C5. Okay, take take Knight F6. Awesome tactics. Well done, White, for spotting this in the midst of all this chaos. 
So now white is creating a mate threat and the rook is hanging. Um, and this actually netted an exchange to white immediately. Uh, bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes was the way to keep the exchange alive. But this looks very very scary because after takes takes both rooks are hanging. But sadly white only has one move to make at a time. And so after rook takes c4, queen e7, it would have only led to a somewhat better position for white. Instead black opted to sack the exchange with pawn takes, take take and f5. And again I would like to pause here because what's coming from here is going to be absolutely shocking again. And I do understand how the players ended up in what they ended up in because the game has already been very taxing. It has been very back and forth. The Cleveland still can be seen crystal clearly. And time at this stage is scarce. But here is something again that would catch most good chess players' eyes. Yeah? I have got a somewhat exposed key. I have got a pin. I've got a queen that I should be able to utilize in attacking that knight on g8. If I accomplish that mission, the game is over, because if two are attacking, this nothing can prevent. So how do we go about this? Queen drops back to g3, stays in the vicinity of the white king, so that when the black queen penetrates, perpetual check is definitely off the agenda. And simply threatening with g takes f5 and mate. And that's essentially it. The game is over. Queen has to go to d7, I take. And um, after takes, queen takes, they have to even drop the bishop back d8 to sort of negate one, one pin by putting another one into the pin. And after bishop e4, note again how I'm moving forwards whilst they are going back with everything they have. Black is almost in a zook -zang. If I can choose how I'm going to finish them off in a large number of ways actually f5 is a winning strategy too so yeah game is over instead of this white is going to land in something really unpleasant in a matter of a few moves he played queen h5 which i find very difficult to blame because this is a forward moving move too but the problem with this move is that it allows the black queen to penetrate and crawl, cause a lot of drama queen a6 was played rook c4 at the beat in order to block d3 once already uh, immediately a massive difference when you see queen g3 guarding that whilst attacking that way was that queen h5 whilst attacking here isn't defending both of these one would have been enough but now suddenly the rook had to come back now that beautiful attack is out in the window and in fact, now it's all about black, again, creating threat after threat after threat. Rook had to come home, queen b2, and rook d1. Now that's again a little bit iffy. f1 would have been way more consistent, because now the rook and the bishop are sufficient to keep the king safe. And I'm simply threatening to take and take all the pawns around the king. And the game is over. Since that rook d1 was played, the queen of course is continuing to be an absolute pest. f1, queen check, king out, very logical. Now I will show you here a pattern, so actually that was what happened in the game. This is exactly what we wanted to have. I imagine all this with the queen being on g3 and the rook somewhere on the back rank. That's a complete mob up. But even here, even here we are winning, because now we managed to defend everything. f7 and f5 are chronically weak. Black played king g7, and here we played something that uh, was a bit of a heartbreaker, c1. Instead, rook f3, rook g3 would have immediately netted the point. Once again, a beautiful example of attack and defense wrapped in one move. It feels so good when you play a move that defends something and attacks something else at the same time. It feels like playing two moves in a row. Now, actually, black, sorry, white got to execute this because here moves have been repeated and now rook f3 was played. And now comes probably the greatest shock of all time in this game. Once again, I'm going very hard on white, but uh, sometimes this is what uh, happens when you ask me to analyze your games. Uh, similarly to the queen h2 shocker, 
this position or blunder that is about to come is perhaps the worst. And very often when I analyze games for my students, I tell them that if you play here queen g5, I will forgive you. I will be very upset, but I will forgive you. Because we all do tactical blunders. And losing a queen like this, it's the worst possible thing in one way that can happen. But it happens to the best of us. But when we play a move like e takes f5, that is not explainable. Because it's crystal clear that this knight is going to take. Knight is going to deny then the rook to come to g3. And basically what we are doing here is that we are making the worst piece on the board the best. And it could never ever happen without us doing it to them. So if I don't take f5, this knight will never, ever get to f5 being the best piece on the board. So what we are essentially doing here is that we are saying, I've got a winning position here. How about if I totally butcher it? So that you get to have a go at trying to kill me now. This is utterly unexplainable. And really, as a coach, I struggle really with uh, offering key further guidance other than what were you thinking when you thought you are going to make their worst piece the best? Once again, the only explanation I can see here plausible, and this is why I tend to be more forgiving, because I think... This was not a position or blunder, it was a tactical one. White must have thought, and of course I don't know their thoughts because I don't talk to these guys, I don't get any notes, but now as I'm looking at it for the tenth time I realize what happened here. He must have thought that on his next move he was going to win the queen due to the discovered attack. Except that knight takes f5 is such a good piece on f5, that after check knight takes actually a defense to queen. So, I will forgive you buddy, because now I realize that this was actually a mistake of a tactical nature, not a horrendous position of call. Having said that, I would like to reveal the winning move too, which is very plain and simple. G3 was needed first, and now we are threatening to take there with a check and taking the queen, and in general just maintaining all the main features of the position, without compromising the rook and improving the knight. GG. Alright, but now actually I'm very proud of myself for figuring out why white took on f5, even though it's a horrid move. Uh, takes back, and now it's a bit of struggle town. Queen g4 check, and note again that from this position, perfectly attacking, perfectly attacking, perfectly defending, in a mere 5 moves, we are going to go to the biggest passivity you could imagine from this position, from white point of view. Watch. Takes, takes, check. Going back. Actually, I will start my mantra here. Going back, going back, going back, going back, going back. This is a cluster disaster. Show as an achievement from this position. And once again, I have to be lenient and forgiving because this is all a direct result of this capture, which I thought to be a winning move. And instead it wasn't, but it's still a testament to how awful things can turn out when we start moving south instead of north. F5 had to be played, and in fact it was an excellent resource. Knight takes queen e4. Funny that, we are moving forward finally again. Tactical threat, rook f5, queen h4. Bishop g5 back, perfectly sound move. And now black actually does have sufficient counterplay around the white king for a draw. So check, takes the pawn. Uh, queen d1, totally fine move. Uh, here actually both players are playing quite good moves despite of being short on time and probably somewhat fatty. Queen e3, queen e4, uh, check. And here is where I think um, black had a mental blank. I don't understand why black didn't play in g 3 check. Wins the exchange back by force, creates a strong mate threat. And after queen g4 take, take bishop f4. Pawn drops, we catch up with this guy without any dramas, and uh, black is a pawn up. The outcome of this game is almost inevitably going to be a draw, but black has the upper hand. So why wouldn't we play knight g3 check here? I really don't know. I think he must have thought that in this position, um, the pawn was not stoppable. Which is actually quite funny, I think, in shift it right away, stops it, so... Yeah, I'm confused. Alright, I don't know. King of 8 was played, and once again, 
good on white for utilizing their only chance take 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 at least now there is a glimmer of hope that this passer can be a weapon as long as the queens are on the board that will be the case of course the simplest way to eliminate that would have been to play queen g3 creating again a mate threat and uh, it's an immediate drop white can either choose to go check check the queen down and go into the same or very similar bishop ending or simply accept a uh, perpetual back here either way dead draw so this is a very tragic end to uh, an incredibly well contested game for both parties queen a1 was played totally focused on uh, some of the least important features of the position at the moment which was his pawn and after e6 it's a heartbreaker, but to my mind, the point went to the side that deserved it more throughout the game because whilst uh, White did miss a lot of winning chances, he has created those winning chances throughout the game. And for that reason, I think it's fair that uh, he walked away with the big W. But we needed to know that Black had his fair chances in this game on occasion to turn it around totally. And on occasion, he had actually missed four throws. Uh, that were given to him on a plate. Overall, a truly fun and uh, good game to analyze. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will be back with game number three soon. In case I forgot to tell you that, Merry Christmas to all of you. I will be back with uh, the rest soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.